Pitt's log, star date November 2022. Following a prolonged hiatus, the horror cult film's crew have returned to their mission to watch and review all 13 of the Star Trek films. We have surveyed the first two and taken extensive notes. Now we return for numbers three and four, the search for Spock and the voyage home. Luckily, I'm not alone out here and joining me are my first officer, Jim Lamming. Hello, sir. And my science fiction officer, Alistair Yule. Aye, aye, Captain. So, before we return to the Genesis planet in search of Spock, I thought we would begin with a discussion about the other big part of the Star Trek franchise, the TV shows. Now, gents, you know that I haven't seen much of the Star Trek oeuvre. I'm not really that familiar with the shows, so I want to know what you guys think of them. I'm going to do this in chronological order. We don't have to go into great extravagant detail going, ah, yes, my 10 favourite episodes are as follows. But just as a general ballpark, how much of the original series have you guys seen and what did you think of it? Why kick off with yourself, Alistair? You've seen all of this, I assume. I have indeed. I uh, quite enjoyed it. It's uh, the original series, obviously, it's, it is a classic. It's given us the movies. Um, I think the... I think with Star Trek in general, it's mainly thought of more, firstly, as a TV series, as a TV show, before it's seen as a sort of movie franchise. Um, I think at this stage, it's where we'd even begin to start watching Star Trek. There are so many spin-offs from it now. Mm. Of course, the original, the classics, um, some great episodes in there, City in the Edge of Forever and Balance of Terror, do the two episodes that stick out in my mind as being great examples. I also think with counter to what we're about to discuss in the movies that if you get a bad tv episode it's only cost you 45 minutes as opposed to a full-length movie mm. and so there's they've not quite got that uh pressure and there's there's more room for experimentation and star trek's a great platform for experimenting with stories yeah because this is essentially uh trying out like a different sci-fi concept every week or solving a different mm-hmm. problem every week. And that's everything, actually, you say every week. You're totally right about the uh, not only the time investment, but the release schedule. If you get a crap episode, you've got another one the next week, right? If you get a crap mm-hmm. film, it'll be like two or three years before your next one. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, Jim, are you much a fan of the original series? Try to get into it. <laughs> um, it's not bad, but it didn't really hold my attention. I think They started to replay it on one of the CBS channels around when the J.J. Abrams reboot came out. So uh, I started watching maybe about four or five episodes, and it was entertaining enough, but it didn't really engage me all that much. And I guess going into a TV show like that, which I know I have seen as a kid, and because it was on BBC Two way back when, probably early night is I I guess it just didn't hold up for me at the time and personally I tend to pick my tv shows quite fussily because they are quite an investment if there's a few series of them so yeah I've seen a few episodes but I never stuck with it I I agree you on that point you know when it comes to watching movies you know we've covered 13 Hellraiser films now oh wait sorry 11 Hellraiser (laughs) films now (laughs) A mere 11. You know, I, I've watched some shite, right? But yeah. the same thing with TV shows, um, I'm getting better at starting something and then just stopping it if I'm not enjoying it. You know, there's quite a few that I've just opted out of uh, entirely. Mm. Whereas back in the day, I used to be a much more of a completionist. You know, if I'd seen like, if I'd walked in and part of it saw on the telly, I'd go, shit, now I need to watch everything. And yeah. I'm getting better at saying no to that. But at the same time, it does put me off Star Trek a little bit, just the sheer knowledge there's like literally hundreds and hundreds of episodes here, you know? So mm. many. There's so many. Star Trek, they've got The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and everyone. There's Discovery, Picard, and Strange New Worlds. It's a phenomenal amount of TV that they've got going. And yeah, in the original series, I think one of the reasons that it's maybe caught the public imagination so much mm. is there's just something about these main sets of this main set of characters, mm-hmm. something about this incarnation of the crew that I just find very likable. They're iconic in a way that I'd argue the next gen crew aren't, minus uh, of course uh, Picard himself. I yeah. don't think that the other characters, the side characters, necessarily have the same kind of recognition or fondness from the general public. 
Mm -hmm. I think I'd agree with that. There's uh, cultural osmosis. I think you could stop anyone on the street and they could name probably the entire cast of the original Star Trek, whereas the further down the line you get with the spin-off shows, the more and more they're going to struggle with that. There's probably some TV shows now that uh, they don't even know exist. I always have to say, before we move on from the original series, is that it holds that sort of charm in the same way that classic Doctor Who does, with the wobbly sets and, uh, you know, an alien planet is being filmed, but will film in a quarry. <laughs> So mm. that style of, like, your budget's showing, but it is possible to still love the show anyway. And certainly with the production values now, in the modern era of Trek, it's it's definitely lost that charm, that low-budget shoestring, mm. that ingenuity to try and make something look good on screen. Yeah, because I think there's maybe a slight double standard with the way that we'll take stuff nowadays, you know, where... If you're looking at something like Star Trek Discovery and people slag off a CGI in it, you're like, well, well hold on. We are aware of yeah. what like show this is part this is sharing a universe with yeah. here. Yes. But at the same time, I guess I guess this would have looked quite cutting edge of the 1960s. You know, because I, I think when we're judging something that came out like 55 years ago, it's difficult to do that in a way that's objective. Both in yeah. terms of maybe some of the some of the sorts of acting that you get, you know, some of the kind of dialogue that you get, or uh, or indeed, as you say, some of the production values are like long sustained shots, mm -hmm. a, a very stationary camera, for instance, almost yeah. a theatrical appearance. I'd like to say as well that uh, Star Trek is was also a product of its time. If we talk technology for a second, like color TV was a brand new thing at the time, so that's why our uniforms, like science and medical officers, of blue. Kirk and command staff of yellow, and then we have red for everyone else, security and engineering. And that that I mean that's these are full body outfits that the, the colours were meant to pop off the screen. That informed their uniform choice back then. We move on to the next generation. This I'm maybe slightly more familiar with. Again, I've not I've not seen very many episodes of it, but my immediate feeling about the next gen. It's basically, I enjoyed watching Picard and I quite enjoyed watching Data. I find other members of the crew a bit more forgettable. I think part of my bias about this is because nowadays it's very difficult to get into a show that isn't uh, serialised. Whereas whilst they broke a bit of boundaries by having, or, or for the, the franchise they did, by uh, doing things like two-part episodes and so on, it, it's still by and large uh, a situation of a weak approach. Now, did you warm to this crew quite quickly? I remember when it first aired back in the late 80s, early 90s, it, it was unusual because everyone knew who the original Star Trek crew were and this was completely different. But, you know, you get used to it, you become familiar with the crew. I didn't watch it really, just so if, if I was doing nothing else and it was on TV, I'd watch it, which helped with it not being serialised, as you say. So every week there's a different encounter with the Ferengi, alien sludge, Q, the Borg. Um, so, yeah, it, it did help if you didn't keep up with it avidly like I did. I, I think I didn't really watch it in any order until it came on Netflix. And even then I only really made it to season three, I think. Although I did watch all the Borg episodes of every series not just next generation i would watch but uh, with regards to the crew um yeah i think there's only a few memorable ones you've obviously got captain picard commander Riker, you know the serial womanizer and uh data probably war for a push you know the, the only klingon mm -hmm. member of the crew mm -hmm. but i i think I had my association with that more towards the films because I've always enjoyed those ones, even the more, well, the, the lesser popular of the next generation films. I've always seen them as the benchmark of Star Trek in my experience because I'd never really watched anything beyond that. So up until recently, I would have said that next generation was the, the bar. And in terms of the sort of best episodes of this, like, do these episodes hold up to you guys? Are they still are they still things you would watch tomorrow and thoroughly enjoy? Oh yeah, I do. I could easily. I mean, the Next Generation is a very easy watch. 
and often very enjoyable. Um, I enjoyed Deep Space Nine, I think, is one of my favourite shows. I didn't mind Voyager. Um, I had my issues with that show, but it was it's still it's still a very entertaining one. Uh, I think mainly the Voyager didn't fully embrace its lost in space premise quite the way it should have, but. Uh, there were some good characters in there, and also some forgettable ones. Actually, before we come on to Voyager, yeah, D- Deep Space Nine is the one I've always been recommended. Folks are saying, David, you'd be a big fan of Deep Space Nine. The thing that mm. makes me kind of curious is it's by the same showrunner as Battlestar Galactica, which I absolutely mm-hmm. loved. So that's that's made me maybe quite intrigued about it, because it also it's the, the show's first kind of venturing into long-form storytelling as well, right? Mm-hmm. With the second half of it, there's a lot of recurring plots, there's a lot of recurring characters, you've got a through line, that sort of thing. Uh, I suppose you could call it the Dominion War story arc. That show was juggling a lot of balls, to say the least. It was, uh, you got the politics between uh, people on Bajor and the Cardassians, the crew that are manning the, deep, the space station are a very long way from home. Like they can't easily call in Federation assistance. They're sort of stranded there. Uh, there's a lot happens, and it's uh, it's perhaps got some of the best villains in all of Star Trek. Who could ever forget Gull Dukat? Yeah, I I always saw it as uh, an inferior series compared to Next Generation, hmm. and well, that was until I watched it properly last year. I started to watch season one, mm-hmm. and I honestly found it a bit of a struggle. And it wasn't until Alistair mentioned the Dominion in the last Star Trek episode we did. I thought, you know, that sounds like pretty interesting stuff. So I picked up where I left off, and true to form, with it being me, I actually left off just where it starts getting very very good so (laughs) uh, i I was hooked from then on in and i've just got past the opening of season six now so it's it's getting very very interesting i like the way it starts off extremely diplomatic and we do have the odd exploration episode just to remind us that this is star trek at its core so we do get the odd away team um we get the odd silly episode with the ferengi or the kids or whatever hollow suite that sort of thing but as the seasons progress they get more and more into the murky war politics territory of it and it's very very well handled from beginning to well to the point where i am now and it just escalates more and more and silly fluff episodes aside which are also very good and work as those ones that you can just dip in and out of it's a fantastic story and it does have you at the edge of your seat a lot I wonder how much that's about the demands of network telly because Battlestar Galactica did a similar thing where as it's starting to heat up, you know, as we're starting to find out who the five are, etc., then we've also got all these absolutely guff storylines like, oh, yeah, the black market one, for instance, or like the one about <laughs> dangers in the mining community and things. Like, these sorts of episodes felt like they, they weren't bad, and some of them were good for world building, but they felt like they were just sort of there to make up scheduling space. We're saying we don't want to push the main plot too quickly. Filler episodes, yeah. Yeah, we don't really know what we're doing with it uh, uh, yet. And secondly, we have a season finale to build to. And yeah. we don't want to run out of ideas because we also have another season lined up. So, yeah. <laughs> and Plus <laughs> they've got 26 episodes a season yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think with uh, like shows like Deep Space Nine, I, I think there is they were much more meticulous in their story arcs. Like they knew what well, each season has its own sort of theme and pushing the main arc forward one step. Um, just as you're mentioning, you're enjoying the show, Jim. Uh, what do you think of the Garrick character? Uh, uh, well, it's ambiguous. <laughs> uh, very funny, though. Um, yes. You, you can't help but like him, even though you know he probably would stab you in the back at any second. Yeah. You like him, despite knowing you shouldn't. I just bring yeah, him up, because yeah. to link this to our Hellraiser chat, Garrick is played by Andrew Robinson, who was uh, Kirsty Cotton's father in Hellraiser. That was Larry. 
Wow, that's good makeup. <laughs> yeah, it is good makeup. <laughs> and just for another one last Hellraiser connection, Terry Farrell plays Jadzia Dax, and in Hellraiser 3, she was the female lead, Joey. Again, like a chameleon. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd never put the two together. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just two actors from... Uh, from Hellraiser and Star Trek, and the same show of Star Trek as well. So I always quite, quite <laughs> enjoyed that link. Right, moving on, we've uh, we kind of covered Voyager early. Jim, you're a fan of Voyager? Uh, what I've seen is actually all right. Yeah. Um, as I say, I've watched all of the Borg episodes. So I've seen the ones Voyager covers as well. And most of the crew were tolerable. <laughs> um, I've got to say I'm not a fan of the holographic Doctor who also had a cameo on Deep Space Nine as well really? was... I quite like the Doctor <laughs> well it's just from the few episodes I've seen so. yeah. this is like a fluffier show isn't it I was to describe it it's kind of a rinse repeat of the next generation with uh, watered down characters I mean, the premise of the show is they get lost in space. They're in what they call the Delta Quadrant, which is the opposite end of the galaxy, and it's going to take them 75 years at maximum warp to get home. So they're heading home. So the premise of the show is like that sort of inverse. They're not exploring. They're trying, They're going in the opposite direction from all the other Star Trek shows. But there's a tremendous amount of what we'll say there are Alpha Quadrant-featured episodes where some problem from home, let's say the Federation or the Ferengi or the Klingons or Romulans. And um, there's a lot of what I personally call Alpha Quadrant episodes in a show that is set in the Delta Quadrant. I mean, there's they did have some good villains in Voyager that were native to the Delta Quadrants. The Herosian and the Vidians stick out. But uh, once the Borg appear, I think they get a bit overused. They can sort of lose their threat value a bit. What do you think, Jim? I think, yeah, I think they probably go a bit too all in on the book. Obviously, they're quite an iconic villain for the series, but uh, having watched Deep Space Nine, you you don't miss them when they're not there. If if it's well written and you have some great characters and a good story, you're not going to miss them. Yeah. The, I mean, the Borg almost make a cameo appearance in Deep Space Nine because the, the the two episode, the, the biggest two part of the series of Next Generation was the best of both worlds. And mm-hmm. um, not to give any spoilers, I know David hasn't seen this yet. He might have to watch it, but that is directly referenced in the opening of Deep Space Nine, and it's a phenomenal opening. Oh, that's also the one that's referenced in uh, First Contact, isn't it? Yes, same yes. battle. Uh, and I know if the, I don't know the particular events, but I know the trauma of the uh, of the events. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Star Trek Enterprise is this one any good? Not really. Um, it, <laughs> <laughs> it, I've watched it once. It, it this one. Um, there's some of the episodes are carbon copies of episodes I'd seen in Voyager. It's a show that it went back in time. So this is like before Kirk and all that. I was Captain Archer, played by Scott Bakula. And I think he, he, if they'd written him better, he'd probably be one of the best captains we'd ever had. But as it is, we didn't get that. Um, it was cancelled after four seasons. And I think it was under threat of being cancelled at the end of the third season. It's the... I mean, the sort of next generation set the bar for seven seasons per Star Trek series, and the cast thought they were going to be in it for seven seven years, but unfortunately it didn't work out. Seasons three and four are definitely far improvements from seasons one and two, but if you watch seasons one and two and th- thought that was the show, I can, I can see why people gave up on it. Right, so what's the main issue with it? Is it the characters? Is it a particular type of storytelling we do badly, or what? I'd say the theme tune didn't help. The characters aren't really that well crafted. It's um, there's it's just missing something. It, uh, it's really difficult to sort of pin down. When the show started getting good, it got really good, but uh, it was there's a lot of plodding storylines. There's a lot of like they're trying to be funny, but they're not. There's too many episodes, I would say, were swings and misses. And it's a lot of sort of what we've seen before. Mm. Now, 
Oh, have you watched this at all, Jim? I've only seen maybe one or two episodes, but I cannot remember. So. <laughs> <laughs> one that I have seen is uh, Star Trek Discovery. I quite enjoyed the first season of Star Trek Discovery, although I also kind of thought it took itself far too seriously. That was <laughs> that was my, my my main issue. That was like, uh yeah, this is be, this is trying to be like a kind of cool, slightly darker modern drama. Yeah, I, I would say that it's Star Trek trying to be Marvel mm. or, 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 or yeah. Disney in, in that sort of nutshell. I think Discovery is where Star Trek became a trend chaser as opposed to a trend yes, center. Yes, absolutely. Like, I mean, you, you can't fault it visually. It does look very impressive. Oh, yeah. But in all its fancy visuals and the, the way it updates, how everything looks. There's a certain charm to the night is Star Trek shows that is lost in the more meticulous looking CGI sets mm. and so on. P perhaps it looks a bit too clinical. I, I'm not sure, but as you say, it does take itself too seriously. But I, I did enjoy it. I, I think I watched up to season three. I think I got about halfway through the first part of that. Um, and but yeah, I, I found myself dropping off around the same time each season. And then when the next one is coming up, I oh, better catch up. And then it's, oh, yeah, it's all right, actually. So, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting compared to Marvel because my immediate point of comparison would be DC. If you excuse it, D the, uh, DC has absolutely no coherent through line, which, <laughs> which to be fair, Discovery definitely does. It's got that same kind of. Clinical is a good word for it in terms of the visuals. It doesn't have like a kind of scrappy charm. It feels a bit emotionally cold almost. Mm. And yes. uh, where we have drama, so it, it sort of lapses into melodrama. Like there were some nice ideas in there. And it was quite a, a nasty version of the Klingons that we're seeing here. Mm. But uh, yeah, didn't really grab me. Yeah, and especially in season three, I think. I, I'd, be, I'd struggle to remember an episode where it didn't finish with people crying. <laughs> you know, I'm so glad you said that because there's one... Oh, I forget what episode it was, but as two characters, they broke down in tears and I burst out laughing because they... <laughs> I mean, one, every episode ended with them crying and it's like the amount of therapy these guys would need just <laughs> after one of these episodes, let alone ten or two traumatized to function as humans anymore and it was just the they've overused it the crying thing it was it was overused definitely now picard again i've seen about well i've seen about half the first season of it i wasn't really getting into it there was some it was lovely seeing an old patrick stewart there uh you know reprising the role was a good dignity about the whole thing I don't know what it was. I just didn't find the story particularly riveting. Uh, I, one of the biggest problems for me, I only watched the pilot, mm. but one of the biggest issues I found is the fact they had to use a stunt double just for him fucking walking. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. It's, it, yeah. I, I, I appreciate the sentiment. I know they want to capture the glory days of uh, Next Generation and all that, but you, you need to let it lie. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're the... Certainly with season two and what looks like we're going to be getting in season three, it's playing like uh, the greatest hits of uh, The Next Generation. The season two gave us the Borg Queen, some Q, some time travel shenanigans, and season three looks set to bring back the full cast of Next Generation. Villain-wise, we're getting Lore, who is Data's evil android twin brother, and it looks like they're bringing back Moriarty. So there's a very good episode of the uh, of Next Generation, I should say, where they're creating a computer sort of holodeck program that could outsmart data. And they developed a character called Moriarty that could outsmart data. But to make this hologram that smart, he became self-aware. And he's trying to escape the holodeck and enter the real world and have a real life. It's a sort of a Pinocchio, but if Pinocchio was evil and Moriarty, obviously. Hmm. And he's actually, I think it's a season one 
episode or season two episode. They brought him back again for more fun in season six. And it looks like he's now reappearing somehow in season three. So I don't know what the story is there, but it'll be interesting to find out. And finally, we've covered Strange New Worlds here before, but we do still have both Lower Decks and Prodigy around. You guys got strong views on Lower Decks or Prodigy? Not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one, one Lower Decks is like if Family Guy did Star Trek, and I've not watched Prodigy. I don't. I mean, there's one thing about the cartoons. I don't know their canonicity. If you know what I mean. Mm. It could, it could be canon, but I don't think it matters. I've heard Lower Decks does improve after the first few episodes. Um, they even get actors who had minor parts in the original series of like Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, and they even visit Deep Space Nine in the show as well. So part of me does want to maybe check it out once I've finished watching uh, DS9, but I'm in no rush. Yeah. I yeah. guess the idea of Family Guy meets Star Trek was already the uh, the Orville, which mm. is yeah, somewhat a, successful, I believe. They sort of beat them to the punch there. Yeah, yeah, and it is to be fair, it's more of a better modern Star Trek than Discovery. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to agree on that. <laughs> it's certainly proving that uh, the old style of or the next generation style of Star Trek can still work uh, for a modern audience. Now we move from the modern Star Trek to the classic Star Trek. Folks, we are going to search for Spock. All that they've loved. All that they've fought for. All that they've stood for will now be put to the test. Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. The word, sir? The word is no. I am therefore going anyway. You do this, you'll never sit in the captain's chair again. Engage all the systems. Clear all mornings. Cleared, sir. One quarter impulse power. Picking up from where we left off, this is The Search for Spock, a film that celebrates the bond between two characters played by actors with a famously prickly relationship. Guys, this is the second time I've seen Search for Spock. Or, well, third time, but second time I can actually remember it, the first time I was a kid. Because Wrath of Khan was still quite fresh in mind, I... I don't know if it was because I was thinking more about the technical advancements that have been made since Wrath of Khan. I thought this film looked amazing. Like, as a feat, the locations were such an upgrade from what we've previously had. You know, the effects were a big upgrade from what we've had before. And I think it did a good job of combining the sort of more arty, special effects-driven concept of motion picture with the character-driven aspects of uh, Wrath of Khan. So basically, for me, this was... I thought this was pretty good. I mean, there are some big issues, which we'll go into in a, in a wee bit, but much better than I remembered it. Now, Jim, you said that you'd also changed the way that you thought about it. Which direction was that in? Did you like it more or less this time around? Uh, I actually didn't find it as entertaining as last time I watched it. It's probably a good 10 or so years since. And... Yeah, I found it had more peaks and troughs than I remembered. It's a good film. There's a lot of great stuff in there. You've got the Enterprise heist, mm -hmm. the, the Genesis planet, especially when it's starting to fall apart. It's got that awesome 80s practical effects uh, look. You know, when stuff's falling apart, you've got those big styrofoam boulders that clearly have no weight behind them, but yeah. still look really <laughs> good anyway. <laughs> um, and those great map paintings of like the volcanoes and everything in the background and yeah i just love the style of those old sound stages where things like there's earthquakes and all sorts going on again brilliant effects and the klingons i think make great baddies in this especially christopher lloyd yes. very very cold and calculated very good but there's also a lot of lulls like particularly the first acts um it's it's cool we see them coming home in the battle-damaged Enterprise, um, you know, just taking stock of everything that's happened. But it's even mentioned at the beginning, you know, what do you think there'll be a parade for us or whatever when we return? No, <laughs> this wasn't a victory. We lost a lot of people. 
yeah, yeah. Th- yeah this is not anything good that's happened so yeah there's little beats like that but then it really s- slows down for me and then, as i say we get the enterprise heist and then when they're on the way it kind of slows down again and then the crew get to Genesis and things pick up again. So it, it's got its moments, but it's also got its real lulls for me as well. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. Um, there's certain scenes. There's one in particular that stands out for me. Do you remember when McCoy's in the bar and he's yeah. speaking to this sort of... Mm. He's, like, he's got these like quill feathers for eyebrows yeah. and stuff. And that, that conversation is like a nothing burger. We never see that character yeah. again. <laughs> that get rid of that scene just have it in dialogue well, McCoy got arrested yeah I can't even recall seeing that one previously like, I, I was sat there watching I was like is this a, a newer version or something or did I just, was I just not paying attention no, at that, all for last time <laughs> that is a nothing character nobody knows who that character I is I might be a bit of a maverick here but I just, I'm going to disagree with a few points have been made right that sequence I thought was good because we got to see DeForest Kelly doing comedy and i thought that whole interaction was just really funny but also it allowed us to see a bit more of a world you know we see bars in this we see cafes in this you know where like kirk's hanging out having his coffee and stuff we meet lots of people in the federation like when when we're stealing the enterprise we don't just see it through a random like window it's through a posh restaurant like the world building i thought was such a step up from what we'd had before i agree with that yeah and uh, something else I wanted to agree with, Christopher Lloyd, I thought, was completely miscast in this. Great actor, far too old for the role. The mm. voice was quite, uh, he's got that uh, sort of old man, a husky old man's voice. When also it's, where it's perfect for the doc and for Fester, Uncle Fester and the Adams family. I mean, think visually he's fine for the role. For the Klingon, his acting's fine. Just for me, it's he's just not quite got the voice for it. Because the Klingons are meant to be big, brutish thugs, and he's maybe if he's had more size-wise, more physicality for the role, um, it would have been better. But certainly, I mean, his. I was going to mention this. There was one Klingon on the bridge that he clearly doesn't like, because he gives him the task of feeding the dog creature, and you know that that crew member doesn't want to. And later on, he's the one that gets executed. <laughs> Elsewhere with it, with this one, right? Kirk, Kirk's obviously back in a bad place. It's like he's completely ignored the optimistic ending from the last movie. And, you know, he's old and past it. There's a reference to the uh, ship itself being like, you know, it's also old and past it, basically. And... For me, I thought the, the kind of introspective nature of the first act, I really enjoyed that. I mean, I think the first half of the film was actually quite a bit stronger than the second half. With the second half, and come more towards the problems actually in a few minutes to give the illusion of uh, structure. But yeah, we do have some spectacular bits. You mentioned the, uh, the stealing of the Enterprise, for instance. That whole sequence was really enjoyable, quite a sort of swashbuckling adventure and things. And... Uh, I don't know, just the return to the uh, Genesis planet itself, the way that they got Spock, you know, the way that, um, that that scene between Spock's dad and Kirk, I thought that was one of the strongest scenes we've had in any of the three films. It was a really good acting moment for Shatner. He was, mm. you know, maybe, maybe because uh, maybe, maybe because Nimoy was going for something quite understated with the film in general. Like, there was very little music for most of it, for instance. Then it felt like he was trying to do a slightly more uh, subtle performance in the previous movies. And it really paid off. You know, we, despite, again, these are two actors that don't like each other, we really got the feeling that he missed his friend. And I think that added an emotional depth that, frankly, I, I wouldn't have been expecting. Yeah, the scene with his father, and as I was saying, that's uh, sort of Star Trek royalty, uh, Sarek. He's, uh, he's appeared in multiple films and multiple roles as well. I do kind of think that because he's asking Kirk to get Spock's body and put him... By the way, just to compare the titles, the search for Spock, do you know where they find them? Exactly where they left him. <laughs> <laughs> so they bring... They want to, Sarek is asking Kirk to go fetch his son's body and bring it back to Vulcan. So all the shenanigans that the crew of the Enterprise pull off after that, I think Sarek's kind of culpable in that. 
Because <laughs> they are fulfilling Sarek's request. Yeah, he's a bit of a dick about that later on. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Vulcans. Uh, oh, by the way, Planet Vulcan looked amazing in this as well. It did, yeah. That was a fantastic, uh, fantastic <clears throat> design we had there. Uh, some, some slightly weirder parts, right? I enjoyed seeing the two guys being knobs to check off and the hoorah, you know, the guy who's, uh, who she dubs Mr. Adventure, right? Yeah. But uh, her forcing him into the closet, I thought, was brilliant. <laughs> Uh, like that, that, that was quite unexpected. Nice little air punch moment. Mm-hmm. However, when we're also when we're meeting the other crew members again, getting a feel for who they are, we have Bones channeling Spock. I didn't like that that was presented as a plot twist later on, when you know Kirk's watching the videos, which is you know funnily enough exactly the same CCTV TV footage that we saw in the mm-hmm. well, the CCTV footage is Wrath of Khan. It's like he's just got yeah. the DVD on, right? <laughs> but uh, during that bit, he's like, oh, so that's what was going on. And we're like, mate, as the audience, we're about 10 minutes ahead of you here. Like, catch up. He might not know exactly what's gotten into McCoy when he breaks into Spock's quarters. That's all I'll forgive him that. But I think the, the penny drop moment, it could have been a bit quicker. And he's reusing yeah, footage yeah. from the first film. It implies that everything we see in all the Star Trek movies is all done from the, the perspective of CCTV footage. It could possibly retroactively mean that the Star Trek franchise is a found footage franchise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, um, not the only instance of them doing that, is it? Uh, no. uh, it gets reused in at least a few more films, if I recall. Uh, one of the, the funny character moments was uh, Kirk accusing the rest of the crew of being on the edge of compulsive behaviour when it comes to Spock. You're like, <laughs> the obvious projection. It's great. Brilliant projection, though. And uh, I, I did like Kirk saying that line, you're all obsessed with Spock. No, Kirk, that's you. <laughs> I had to, speaking of Spock, i got to give Larry Nemo some credit here. When he's directing this movie, he doesn't appear in it. Like He appears at the very end and that's it. Then yeah. you've got when Shatner directs a movie, Batter's God, right? So there's a bit more of a, uh, there's a bit, a bit more of a modesty about the way that Nimoy handles the material mm-hmm. here. And it was probably better for him because wasn't it his uh, debut feature as well? So it was probably easier for him to take a step away from the front of the camera while he's getting to grips with his first film as well. So. Mm. What yeah. do you guys feel about the explosion of the uh, of the Enterprise? Because I think if he gave it some good dramatic impact, like it was handled with the gravitas, it's uh, I expect for, it would have been kind of similar if the most recent Star Wars films had blown up from Millennium Falcon, right? Because this is uh, it's a symbol of the franchise. It's something mm. that uh, that you know people love this vehicle. Character really in its own right. As we're watching it get destroyed, I think they did a, did such a good job of that. It was spectacular, but it was also like kind of sad, yeah, and excessive. <laughs> uh, I, I think if the odds were slightly more overwhelming, it would have maybe paid off that little bit more. But it seemed like a lot for the amount of Klingons that were boarding the Enterprise. Mm. It it didn't seem like a no-win situation. Yeah. Because yeah. they went straight for the bridge. They could have quite easily gone anywhere. Or, you know, they could have done anything, but I guess it's quite a bold move and it does add a bit more drama to it. And it was impressive to see it all happen and play out. Again, that was that was a up there with the, the heist from earlier. What's playing into is maybe the worst tendency of the film which is the need to try and contrive drama where there already is some. So, like, mm. the way that the Genesis planet is about to explode, that time bomb is only there. So there's a countdown running through the movie. It's not... Yeah. Like, there's a, good, a particularly good reason for it being in the script. And there's definitely not a particularly good reason for the planet to be about to explode with everyone deciding to hang around on it, including the <laughs> Hawkins. <laughs> and... Uh, oh, sorry, the... Um, I'm talking about the Klingons, Klingons, right? Yes, yes. Klingons. Right, there's no reason for them to be hanging around with this thing. Going, oh yeah, it's a dangerous weapon. It's about to explode. <laughs> right. Then when when we have the death of David, now in Wrath of Khan, the reveal that David was Kirk's son 
was overshadowed because there was something more interesting going on at that point. In this one, David's death is overshadowed because there's something more interesting <laughs> at this point. Like the character was kind of done dirty. Um, and Wrath of Canon mm. was nice as a like giving Kirk a kind of new motivation. But because Kirk then for, seems to have forgotten all his optimism from last time, you know, when he's like, find a new, you know, new thing to live, that sort of yay, go sort of mentality. We don't have that now. He's just in a kind of miserable middle-aged malaise. And then David dying is another shit thing that happens to him. Yeah. And, uh, and just to rub salt in the wound. Yeah, the, the, the son he's just found out. But I mean, I'm assuming his timeline's a matter of days. Um, yeah. So the son he's just found out about gets killed. Not only that, it's also revealed that he basically cheated the, on, on Genesis in, in order to make it work. Uh, by using, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember what it was called, protometers or something like that. Protomatter. Protomatter, that's one. And uh, they, they could have quite easily come up with a better reason for Genesis not working than him being too much like his dad, which they've just kind of shoveled in out of nowhere. <laughs> oh, God. Like, uh, because it's very interesting on a related point, the stupidest line of dialogue in the entire film so the guy telling Kirk that his career is defined by rationality. I'm like, I'm a casual yeah. fan, and even I know that it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they've tried to put that onto his son, like, obviously, to give them parallels. So when he's explaining this to Savik, he goes, well, just like him and the Kobayashi Maru, you and cheat your you way do. to success. Now, personally... I know the film's older than that. Well, same age as me, actually. So nearly 40 years old. But they could have probably written a better reason for the planet crumbling than him cheating. I mean, in all the previous descriptions of it, it needed to use a planetoid or something like that to work. Where they didn't use it when Genesis went off in the Wrath of Khan. They were in a nebula. There was no yeah. planetoid nearby, so they could have used that as the excuse instead of just making this character seem even worse. No, you mean the, the nebula <laughs> collapsed in and formed a yeah. planet, and then it could obviously fall apart after that. I mean, that, that could quite easily have been the reason rather than, well, oh, I'm actually a bit of a shit scientist. Really. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. If you're going around gallivanting across the galaxy in a starship, he can be a bit of a cowboy. Science doesn't lend itself to cowboyism <laughs> quite as elegantly. So I've got another uh, thing I want to bring up here about the, the villains. This main uh, Klingon, Christopher Lloyd's character. So Wrath of Khan was a good example of how you, can, how you managed to really personalise a conflict. And this one, I didn't think they had that. I think, like, I mean, they, they, they were on the planet and then it, it becomes personal after he shoots David, but he shoots David like most of the way through the movie. And uh, I think for it, so for me, it lacked a sort of personal edge, which, uh, which I think we totally had last time of this guy doesn't like Kirk and, and here's why. You know, this guy doesn't even know who Kirk is. And, uh, you know, Kirk doesn't know who this guy is until very late on in the narrative. And so... It just felt a little bit arbitrary. Yeah, it is a bit. Yeah, it's kind of, as well as Christopher Lloyd's character performed on screen, and I thought, you know, they were really good, and his henchmen, they, they served their part well, but their part was to provide a bit of threat, and that was it, really, because you've already got Genesis collapsing. That's, as you say, your ticking time bomb. And I, I, I guess he was just added to make the odds seem even more against the crew mm. just to have that little face off at the end which and it was, was a very little face yeah. you know, it was a very little face off I mean that lasted about 30 yeah. seconds yeah yeah but it, it was pretty decent and then the way Kirk <laughs> gets out of it as well was quite clever I guess See, uh, I quite like this that. is where I'm like did we watch the same movie I thought the last <laughs> fight was absolute bollocks it's, um, <laughs> the use of a double as, was hilarious I, as I say I, stunt I'm, doubles collided well yeah the, the, the stunt doubles were glaringly obvious even more so than that episode of uh, Space Seed <laughs> yeah <laughs> but 
for, for me, it was everything that was going on at the time, the environment collapsing around them. So I, I, I was, I think I was more focused on that than the actual fight itself. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, the fight was about 30 seconds. Now, it's worth mentioning that we've repeatedly referred to uh, this uh, baddie as uh, Christopher Lloyd's character, <laughs> which is, his name, I believe, is uh, Crudge. Now, the thing is, that's because that's all he really is to us. Like, he doesn't, re- he's, he doesn't have, a, as you say, he's, he's there to up the odds. He's there to, he's there to just be yet another antagonist in a situation where we're already on board a gigantic bomb with no vehicle to get off yeah, yeah. and yeah. I, I i just thought the, the fight scene just sort of felt a bit like the, the heart wasn't really in it we're just going through emotions going yeah we need one of these you know 30 <laughs> seconds later that'll do i want to comment on the fight scene a, a little bit more detail because uh, the, like you know, Christopher Lloyd pushes Shatner to the ground and then there's like the planets falling to pieces around them and a ledge collapses and Christopher Lloyd just falls over at that point. But then we have a hilarious scene of, and I don't know why I've never noticed this before, but I just this time on this viewing, I found it so funny. Kirk lunges at the Klingon and he screams as he does it. Ah! As he's charging <laughs> off the edge of the cliff. I just really found that funny this time. I just want to quickly just touch on before we move on from the uh, blowing up of the Enterprise. Um, I understand why the film would do it, and it becomes a thing now in the Star Trek movies to blow up the Enterprise. Um, but only the saucer section gets blown up. And, then, and, and you know, the, the Enterprise didn't fall into enemy hands by virtue of the fact that it fell into a planet's gravity and became an asteroid. But... You know, if that was another battle, they used the self-destruct. You've still got the engineering section. You've still got both warp missiles. You've, there's a lot that an enemy power could take from that, if you know what I mean. Hmm. I bet that's inspired fan fiction the world over. <laughs> Probably not, but... Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah I, I, I like to think we'll be searched for Spock fans going, oh, but, but what does happen to the Enterprise? <laughs> Uh, and Christopher Lloyd's character calls Kirk, uh, or he calls the Federation intergalactic thugs, and that annoyed me, that use of intergalactic. This is a thing in all uh, sci-fi where the writers just don't quite get their terminology correct. So it would be there's interplanetary within a solar system, there's interstellar between different solar systems, but intergalactic, that's if, you, if you've travelled to the Andromeda galaxy, for instance... That would make you intergalactic. We're all in the same galaxy here, um, so it's intergalactic's a bit. Uh, I mean, maybe he was exaggerating for effect, but usually Star Trek's the one show where the science is a bit harder, and they follow that. And they're just a bit better with these details. But that was a that was a slip up there, I think. Mm. On another, I, mean, I don't know if it's a slip up. It's maybe if I just maybe an ironic comment on uh, on Shatner, but. You know, when we're watching a video about the Genesis planet, right, and it's uh, Captain Kirk introducing it and speaking through it, right? But you're like, so Captain Kirk is using the same footage from the video that he watches in Wrath of Khan. He's using the same voiceover, but he's redone it. <laughs> like, why did he need to do this? <laughs> I was, I think they just couldn't get the, we know he couldn't get the actress back from the second film. They had but, the footage. Um, oh, I, I, they I, had I the footage. It. Put it down to his ego. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I was thinking. It's like, it's like we're going, yes, I think this film needs more me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mm-hmm. that ending, though, I thought was brilliant. Like, at points, the second half, particularly the last act with its anticlimactic fight and uh, unemotional death, I think the last act picked up immensely when we got back onto uh, Vulcan, you know, and Spock's coming back. And of course, mm-hmm. you know, we know that he's going to. But it's still emotionally satisfying seeing their reunion. Mm. And whilst Kirk gives an absolutely terrible uh, moral <laughs> lesson at the end about how the needs of the, <laughs> the, needs of the, of the, of the one uh, were greater than the needs of the many, right? Which you're like... That's probably not also probably also not the way that you'd summarize this. Consider, I suppose he's 
generously I'll interpret this as he's saying that, you know, I'm the one, I need this. So I so I decide to risk several lives <laughs> in order to, and blow up a ship in order to bring you back to satisfy myself. But I, it was nice. It was it was a heartwarming moment. I liked the, the, the Vulcan scene at the end. I liked it. It was nice just to see them all back together again and just having five minutes, I guess. <laughs> mm. And, of course, we're getting a couple of new uh, things going on in this one. We get the uh, we get the, the Vulcan... I'm um, sorry, the Klingon. <laughs> Stop saying Vulcan there. The Klingon <laughs> Bird of Prey, which, of course, is going to be coming back for the next film. Uh, you know, we've now got uh, a crew that's all, uh, that's all united. We've now got a bit more spark to them. We've now got a trial, which is going to be ongoing in the next film as well. Uh, it sets up part four very nicely. Mm. But overall, my main issues with it were, as I said, the slightly contrived drama, the impersonal nature of the conflict, the big story beats that just didn't really carry that much dramatic weight. And that sort of ruins it because I think the first half of this is really, really strong. You know, I thoroughly enjoyed just watching all the, like, all the kind of the, the character drama early on. I liked watching, yeah. watching them, like them, like discussing what they, what how they, how they can regroup. I liked them come to terms with the idea they have a responsibility to go back and get Spock and the relationship with Spock's dad, and basically just how to handle grieving. It was a, a good film, but got worse. But then, <laughs> but then found itself again, a bit like Captain Kirk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would yeah. compare it to a season opener, a two-part season opener like season three or four of mm-hmm. a tv show more than an actual feature length movie for, for the quality of what we get um i so, said like, visually it's great great score when we've got it um james horner returning like with that opening was brilliant you know yeah. reminding you of wrath of khan again but the, the way it's put together and just how i felt at the end i thought you know this feels like it's retconning what happened previously obviously with spot regenerating and then it's taking us into something better which you know feels more like a two-part tv episode than an actual yeah. film it's kind of your in-between film i mean you got the wrath of khan and to get from wrath of khan to the voyage home this is the film that strings that uh, together yeah. and i think for those three films they do function very good in terms of continuity and it, it's, it's a really good trilogy. Each film leads directly into the next one. Mm, absolutely. And yeah, as you say, continuity-wise, it is, it is very good, especially the way they've uh, kind of got Spock's consciousness into Dr. McCoy mm. from what he did to him yeah. in the previous film, which, mm. you know, was apparently not intended but works exceptionally yeah. well, considering. But then you also get those little bits I mentioned earlier where they've suddenly decided David's actually half-assing everything and then kill him off. <laughs> there is a <laughs> crappy character motivation for Kirk. But uh, yeah, the, in general, it, it works. So how many uh, stars are we going to give this one? I am going to go with 3.5. It's very close to being a four, but just... Uh, too much crap at the beginning of the third <laughs> act. <laughs> yeah, I've got to give it a three. I'm going to join with David and give it a three and a half. There's some excellent stuff in this film. I wouldn't say I loved it, but I do definitely like it. Um, and the pacing issues, there's some tweaking that could have been done to make this film a more enjoyable experience. Well, there's, uh, as we mentioned, the great continuity with that leading straight on into the voyage home. So that's what we shall do, folks. The voyage home. Earth is on the edge of destruction. We cannot survive unless a way can be found to respond to the problem. The key to saving the future. Spock, you're talking about the end of every life on Earth. Can be found only in the past. We're going to attempt time travel. Sulu, take us home. A big angry rod threatens Earth unless it can communicate with some humpback whales. So the crew go back to the 1980s in order to find some. It's a mammal out of water comedy that, on paper, must have looked absolutely awful. But you know what? This is my favourite Star Trek film. I think this is just so enjoyable. It really it 
it's true to the to the series without uh, like with, without like go, being by the numbers in any meaningful way here. Like this is really funny in places. It's got good drama. It's really exciting. I would call this if we're using this as a trilogy two to four. This is the last crusade of that trilogy. Got Wrath of Khan, which is Raiders of Lost Ark. Everyone likes that one. And for some reason, it's the one that's like, it's going to be regarded as the best when you see it in lists. We have a slightly darker, slightly moodier middle one. And then we have this, the more lighthearted, fluffy affair, which for me is even more enjoyable than the one that, one of the ones that came before. Basically, I... I absolutely loved this movie and i can't believe it was good considering what the premise for it is <laughs> how does this compare to wrath of cat i think we all liked it oh yeah i uh, love this film i mean if you were to just read if you were to get this script your movie produces this script lands on your desk and you have a reader you go, this is bonkers like what were they on when they thought of this <laughs> but it, it somehow works far better than it should despite everything that could have potentially gone wrong with it I, it's a great film. It's a great. It's a welcome change of pace as well. This is much more of a fun adventure uh, compared to previous track entries. Oh, absolutely, it's got by far the best Kirk in it as well. You know, going into these hmm. movies not really knowing the character, so just sort of seeing a kind of middle-aged man who's a bit down in the dumps for a while. This was my first time of really meeting Captain James Kirk. You know, this is the Captain Kirk that's the hero. He's a womanizer. He's the space traveler. He's on kids' lunchboxes. Everyone wants to be him or be with him. And I got it this time, which in the first three films, as much as I enjoyed them, or at least as much as I enjoyed two of them, you just don't really have that kind of magnetism about Kirk. Here, it just seems like he's, have, he's having a great laugh doing this movie. And I really enjoyed the relationship we got between Kirk and uh, Gillian in this. You know, it's a real shame that she didn't come back uh, because she had such good chemistry with Shatner. She makes you believe that she enjoys Shatner's company. She's <laughs> And uh, I'm glad to have seen her go on to do Child's Play, so she also has a horror connection. But the way that she goes, yeah, I'm going to give up my, uh, my entire life here and fuck off to the 21st century with Kirk, and then goes... All right, catch you later, Kirk. I'm off to look at the whales again. <laughs> and you're like, yeah. oh. And then, you know, she gets that sign that I'll come back for you. She's actually liberated. She is. She's not going to just chase Kirk. He's going to be chasing her from this point and then seemingly just gives up before the next film. <laughs> yeah. it's The same can be said for the rest of the cast as well. Everyone just looks like they're having an absolute blast. And especially you've got uh, James Doohan. He seems to be relishing his part, especially when he's trying to work the computer, asking it to, mm. you know, turn on, and then try speaking into the mouse. <laughs> Just little moments like that, you can tell he's having a blast. And I don't think I've seen a better representation of Doctor McCoy and Spock's relationship than in this one as well, mm. because you can yeah. see McCoy wants Spock to kind of remember who he is, remember like who everyone is as well as himself. And he tries to bring that out of him with that usual back and forth they have. Mm. Where, But this time Spock is probably being a bit too Vulcan and not really showing his human side. And the, the way it progresses throughout the film is very funny, just seeing McCoy just working him and working him each time they're, they're on the screen together. It, yeah, we get a lot great. of obvious fondness between them. Do you imagine McCoy's had some form of like argumentative blue balls during this time he's walking <laughs> away but no one else is taking him on? You know, you imagine he'd be, he'd be going, oh yeah, you know, Spock's a son of a bitch and stuff like that. But then as soon as the doors close, he cries for him. Yeah. <laughs> McCoy gets some brilliant moments. Yeah, I liked his... He's talking with Spock. Spock goes, uh, forgive me, Doctor, but I'm receiving a large number of distress calls. <laughs> with goes, I have no doubt. I will say, actually, just to quickly go on McCoy and bring back the search for Spock a little bit, when he was getting busted out of prison by uh, or a jailbreak by Kirk, and he finds out that he's got uh, Spock's soul trapped in his brain, he goes... 
that that green blooded son of a bitch is for all those, <laughs> was for all those arguments he lost. I just love that that would be McCoy's perspective on it. <laughs> uh, with McCoy, we also get a bit of the hospital at the end. You know, where mm. we 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 get some nice comedy of him of him there, like absolutely shocked by these primitive twentieth century yeah. uh, techniques. And then you've got that woman who's clearly ill, he just gives her some medication, and then later he has for leaving in yet another swashbuckling chase. Uh, you know, she's saying, I'm feeling much better and stuff. It's like it's a little moments of comedy like that. I, they mind the potential out of these kinds of scenes of them interacting with the 1980s. Yeah, they, it really does make it so much better than, I guess, the, the stoic sci-fi that we've had before it really gives it an opportunity to be funny i suppose i mean th that's one of the biggest draws of this one is that it's so light-hearted and fun throughout mm. even the bizarre opening 20 odd minutes where there's a giant licorice also threatening the earth <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, we'll it's talk just, about that in a second yeah <laughs> it's it's just so it, it feels a lot more unrestricted than the pomp of the, you know, way everyone has to address each other in the previous films. Uh, everyone has a rank, everyone addresses each other in certain ways. But here, they're just let loose and having fun. And, and yet the thing is, the humour all comes from character and situation. It's not like set up and gag or anything like they don't break character for the sake of a joke or anything like that like you get in quite a lot of comedy movies it just seems to be very organic because we've got 23rd century space explorers trying very poorly to blend in yeah um, yeah meanwhile, like, um, it's so good at when you, <laughs> how straight he plays it all yeah that's great and kirk thinking he's kind of with it like knowing mm. the lingo and the mannerisms and so on and just getting it absolutely wrong is great as well yeah and there's so many moments that i really appreciate this the fact that during the cold war they've obviously we've now got this russian guy asking the residents mm. of san francisco where is the nuclear vessels <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just enormous red flags right there and uh spock and kirk with a bewildering inability to answer the question, do you guys like Italian? <laughs> <laughs> the yesing and knowing <laughs> goes on after that. Um, it's it's absolutely fantastic. And I love how much all the crew get to do in this in this film, where they don't always get that in the previous ones. This one sort of gives everyone something to do. Yeah, they've all got their time to shine because we've got three different subplots all going on at the same time, and all of them are crucial to complete yeah. the mission. Yeah, there, there's not there's nobody in it that you could like miss, for instance. Um, everything has you need to get the the whales. We've got to get the big glass to put into it. We've got to recrystallize the dilithium. There is so many problems that they have to overcome. Essentially, this is. Um, in one sense, this is this film chronicles the most difficult Deliveroo journey ever made. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the uh, Mr. Sulu, I think, the, where there's a slight weakness is he gets a helicopter pretty fucking easily. <laughs> yeah, he, he smooth talks the guy at the depot. Yeah, I can imagine he's pretty good at that. To be fair, you know, <laughs> he, he does have a certain charm to him, but it's it's. Good, like, even though he probably has the least to do out of everyone, he still has a nice amount of time away from the helm, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. And going back to the little comedic beats as well, both times where you've got the the ship, the uh, Vulcan, no, sorry, the Klingon, is it Warbird, Bird, Bird of yes, Prey, right. um, landing and taking off, we've got great sight gags of just ship blowing everywhere and people being blown about they, they just work really well even though they're really silly little things like that yeah. you've got the, the bin men the first time they land the, the what the hell is that and then bail and then you've got the joggers the next time it blows them nearly blows mm -hmm. them away very good sight oh yeah there's, there's there's so much to laugh about this stuff I was just going to say, we're going to talk about quickly about the probe that is heading towards Earth and that mm. creepy sound effect that it makes. 
what I know, what I realized during what this watch of the film is that essentially the story is very similar to Star Trek: The Motion Picture. There's an mm. enormous probe on its way to Earth of immense power, and it's trying to communicate, and it wants a response. And conceptually, that puts Star Trek: The Motion Picture and Voyage Home kind of the same film, but one is such a more satisfying <laughs> <Yeah>. experience. <laughs> They got this yep. is a swing and a hit, not a swing and a miss as well. Although, as the motion I picture. do have to say, I did actually catch the motion picture at the cinema not too long after we recorded the last Star Trek episode. Oh, yeah. And seeing it on the big screen makes all the difference. It was yeah. like watching a different film. Mm. Although, I think it was what they called the, the director's edition. No, it wasn't the director's cut. Yeah, but, but, uh, something like the director's edition or preferred version or whatever. Um, mm. But yeah, just seeing all those massive like map paintings and sci-fi images on the screen with that Goldsmith score was fantastic. Yeah. Just added another level to that film. So I'll probably never watch that on TV again. Yeah. But because yeah. you know, the score for this one, oddly Christmassy. Yeah, yes, I, found that as well. y- yeah, when it opens up, you've got more security footage of the last film. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yep. And yeah, like, I, I did think, ah, this, this film feels very festive. <laughs> Another continuity question, right? I could be wrong on this. The guy who takes a call at the beginning of the film, was he the guy who got forced into the closet during the last film? want to say yes, but I don't think it is. I don't want to check in case I'm wrong, but (laughs) in my head canon, that's the same guy. There we go. Officially now it is. We we focus a lot (laughs) on the humour of this one, but they do have a few serious bits, and something I was kind of glad they didn't shy away from is when we see the footage of the whales being cut open. Mm. Because we have to remind people that if there's a heart behind this film, and there definitely is, it's about that. You know, they, if Save for Wales is a big thing in the 1980s, and whilst I have absolutely no doubt if this film came out tomorrow, it would be dismissed as like having a some sort of a woke agenda or oh, something along those yeah. lines. <laughs> um, it's a highly political film here, and I think it's really good that they used this sort of fun space adventure as a platform to look at this, to look at the kind of commitments, I guess, that we as humans have to the world around us. And just as when we're watching whales get cut open, it is jarring, it stands out, and it should stand out. It should be unpleasant. Yeah. So that was the the darkest bit of the movie, but also it was so necessary because it gives emotional stakes at the end when we see the whales, you know, swimming off in the uh, the, the new twenty third century waters, and they're all free. And the the big rods decided, well, there's whales there, so I'm just going to fuck off. <laughs> <Right? And, laughs> But it was a way of like for Rogers saying they haven't destroyed all the all the whales. You know they've done something good. They've conserved the species here, and they just I thought that that was really quite moving. It definitely got a very excellent conservative message, conservation <laughs> message, I should say. <laughs> Moving on from that part, the look of this, that ending with the whales is one part of this. But when you've got the uh, bird of pre- bird of prey hanging over the boat as well, this is a very cinematic look. I mean, most of the films seems to be mm. shot on location as well, which is great. So this in no way looks like just another TV episode or anything. No, it definitely looks like there was more money behind this one for a start. I mean, even the beginning where we see them on Vulcan, that that massive matte image of the ship and, you know, the, the, the Vulcan engineers working on it so that was beautiful and it just looked great throughout like all the all the effects of uh, starfleet when they're under attack from the probe and well as you say all the way to the end where you've got them intimidating the fishing boat it, mm-hmm. it just looked like a, a different step like a, the whole step up from the film we just watched prior and it also shows in the locations as well. We've got, again, some very nice immersive sets. Uh, on the set front, with the Bird of Prey, I liked that we see a kind of a rejig of the seating situation there. And it repositions Kirk as being uh, the sort of first among equals, 
where in the way of Christopher Lloyd's character, he was kind of sort of sat upwards and everyone mm. else is below him in the circle. It was much more of a throne room when it was uh, Christopher Lloyd. Yeah. And he, here, he was sat up in a whole layer higher than everyone else, yeah. Yeah, and here it's, it's mimicking the Enterprise. Yeah, uh, I assume those Vulcans with the weird pointy hats of you know, giving it a bit of a refit. Oh, also. yeah, little Christmas <laughs> elf hats. Yeah. <laughs> uh, funny as that, yeah. But it's also when, when Kirk gets some money through that uh, exchange with the glasses, first thing he does is then evenly distribute it among the crew. Again, this is Kirk being the first among equals. He's the yeah. captain, but it's a crew that works together. Mm. Yeah. And I, th- I think we yeah. do, we get that sort of camaraderie in this. It's no longer like just the here's the Kirk show. Yes, he's a protagonist, but as we're saying, everything needs to work for them to be able to do this uh, this mission. And he's not even necessarily doing the... In fact, he, Full Stop isn't doing the most dangerous part of this. Like, the most dangerous work goes to, uh, goes to Chekhov. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Probably, probably the person who's least suited to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess yeah. Um, they aren't fully versed on conflict of that era and so on. Uh, it does make for a, a fun little moment when he does get captured and is being questioned. Mm. They, they could have probably played on that a bit more, but I like the fact they kept it light and brief because I, I think any film these days would have probably tried to get a bit more out of that situation. It's weird considering how much higher the stakes are in this one than Wrath of Khan, but how much less intense it is than Wrath of Khan. Because they keep going, well, Wrath of Khan, they want to uh, create their own planet. Uh, well, I suppose it could also dump up as a weapon. They want to create their own planet and fuck off. But it's a very, uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very tense conflict that we have between Khan and Kirk. And this one, they're going, all right, well, the world's about to be blown up by a gigantic, uh, as you said, licorice all sort, unless we can get some whales. But you're like, unless we can get some whales. <laughs> when we have the time travel element... Which was very casual. Yeah, they talk about it quite casually, but then I like that they make it look really dangerous. Now, the way that Spock immediately goes, yeah, this could be Earth whales, as if that little course he was doing before they mm. found him, like that was part of the curriculum, was it? But, uh, but using that um, as a basis of going back, I, I like that we see the ship kind of like, like almost about to fall apart here. You know, they say that unlike, say, the time turner in Harry Potter, well, they could just take the time turner and go back in time anytime they want, and there's no real reason the characters don't do that again in the series or, like, go back and kill Voldemort's parents or something. Um, they, they they don't, or kill Voldemort, I suppose, but they, they don't uh, do that here because they sell that this is something you can't just do whenever you feel like it. You know, it presents a risk mm. to the ships, and it's... Also, slightly uh, not, not horror, but uh, that kind of surrealist imagery afterwards sort of sells the discombobulating nature of it. Yeah, you've got that weird CG uh, Evangelion style trip uh, while while they're going back in time, which uh, it was probably the weirdest moment of the film as well. Um, it just oh. felt extremely disjointed and just bizarre. <laughs> and then all of a sudden we're into that comedy again. It's, it's really weird, but also really well done as well. I guess they needed something to represent a, a visualization of going back in time and it not being something so straightforward, despite they're coming to that conclusion quite casually. There's also like, there's good tension to it or at least uh, this is where the race against the clock really works rather than feeling the force because we don't have a villain for like yeah. 99% of this film there's no like mm-hmm. we have we have antagonists you know the um in this case the US military who I can only imagine in real life would have shot a Russian on sight in a yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but like here there are various the antagonists they're not various the baddies because they don't know what's going on here and if I've even taken to a hospital, it's a game that probably wouldn't happen in real life. Yeah. They go, but mm-hmm. in, in real life, it would take them to to a there if they're being really generous, they take them to a military hospital. They must have one on base, as opposed to all right, we're going to take them to a general hospital. Oh, really intentionally <laughs> funny bit. I don't know what the fuck moment is when 
he's, he, he tells Jillian she can help as well, which is totally ne- necessary. You know, it's it's good it's good that she's as a character she's very true. Essentially, aside from being the love interest, she introduces the audience to Wales and by extension inter- explains what Wales can do to the characters. But then we go, we need your help. You go, okay, we have this marine biologist. We need her help. What's she going to do? Somehow sources three sets of scrubs. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of think that there's, there's so much good about this film that you do sort of forgive the the oversights um, mm-hmm. or continuity issues. But yeah, no, she, she was a great character, sourcing scrubs. You, you'd think that would be McCoy's job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are a couple of what the fuck sorts of moments here. I like the random nun that we have at uh, SeaWorld, just doing the tour. It's <laughs> quite <laughs> odd. Yeah, that was that was odd. It and was, a soldier as well. It was such a such a specific group that it just made it seem more realistic. Weirdly, it kind of it been you know the the village people wouldn't be out of place in that group. Whatever <laughs> yeah. we think, San Francisco. They arrive at night. We then see them leave the ship, and then we see them during the day on the main street. Where did they sleep? Do they sleep? Well, <laughs> they, there is the bird of prey. There's the bird but of wait, prey. But we see leave the bird of prey. We're like walking away from a bird of prey going, all right, let's check it out. Sunny day, San Francisco. We're wandering around. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. It's a small point. It, it, it's not like it's not like I'm going to go, oh, yeah, I tell you what, I brought the film down a star. Why? Because we didn't see Kirk sleep. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, brings a, it brings back a pizza, at least. So, you know, at least I didn't go to waste. Mm. Yes, that's uh, true. That, that could have taken a much worse turn. He had the utility. <laughs> so, we all know that this film is brilliant, but do you guys have any faults with it? Tough one. Uh, I don't think so. It, it was more satisfying a whale movie than the entire Free Willy franchise. <laughs> <laughs> it repeated plot points from Star Trek 1 far better. It, it just worked. Right down to the silly hats the Vulcans wore. We, we did have to get another Kirk hero moment at the end. Oh, God, however, yeah. Where yeah. the uh, ship lands in the water and the cargo bay starts to flood with uh, Scotty and Jillian inside. So, you know, he has to save the day there. Yeah, they see there's no way to reach them. And then suddenly, a <laughs> middle-aged dad bod Kirk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, like... I, f- I think that was just there for, a, yeah, as I say, a hero moment for the captain. Um, not entirely necessary. Could have probably just got away with landing on the water and releasing the whales without having that little bit of mild peril at the end. But, you know, mm. it's it's a very good film. I, I think maybe the first 20 minutes is a bit too out there. You know, with this weird probe like we do see it encounter a few vessels in the space station before it gets to earth so you know we've pretty much firmly established what it can do by the time shit starts kicking off at starfleet like headquarters Mm. um so maybe they drag that out a little bit too much but that's my only real complaint because it's just a genuinely fun film to watch from beginning to end yeah it's tough to really pull holes at it, even if there's little continuity things, scrubs for instance, but it's still it does it in no way mars the thing. <laughs> no, you, no. You, you can forgive any inconsistencies if any, because <laughs> it's just such a good time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's such a good follow-up where they're able to harness the the cloaking device from the last film is necessary for this one to work. Mm. Yeah. But I like that it gives a really good through line between the movies as well. Like, it's not like this was planned as a trilogy, but it does make it feel like a trilogy. You know, importantly, yes. it makes you feel glad if you've just watched uh, part three before it. And there's a very nice sort of contrast going on here. We've got them getting used to the Vulcan ship, you know, finding all its weird nooks and crannies, and we have them doing the same thing in the 1980s. But the thing is, it doesn't feel derpy because this is what the film's are, it's what the show is, of they go somewhere new and then learn the customs of a place of rise. Mm. It's just it happens to be Earth this time around in the, yeah. in, in the 80s. And yep. yeah, I, I, I thought there was a nice sweetness to the whole thing, like way that Gillian Taylor 
suddenly switches her allegiance because she knows if they give a shit about the the yeah. whales, which her colleague obviously doesn't. And then, <laughs> oh, that betrayal when they're going. I, we didn't bother telling you about these about us moving yeah. about, about moving the whales because you thought you'd be upset. Right? <laughs> like, uh, not, right. not only are the whales gone, that entire area is drained as well. Yeah, the yeah. most depressing yeah. sight yeah. ever. <laughs> but that not telling her that <laughs> you do feel that betrayal. That's just not on to not yeah. deny someone a goodbye. That gives her every reason to want to go forward in time hundreds of years. She goes, well, yeah. <laughs> we haven't learned how to be nice to each other yet. <laughs> Another thing I picked up on is inside the, the, the spacecraft, it's quite smoky. Mm. And again, when Chekhov and Uhura are on the uh, naval vessel of the Enterprise, again, it's quite a smoky interior in there as well. I don't know if there's any production design reason behind that, or maybe well, the just, ships were quite sm- steamy. They were smoking between sets. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's, it's one thing that uh, shows the difference between, I think, Federation and Klingon technology. Yeah, the, uh, I think even yeah. in the TV shows, there's, there's a bit of a haze in the yeah. uh, Klingon vessels. We, we search for Spock. I was thinking when I was watching it that this was much more of a... I felt like more of a journey than the first one did. You know, the first one, they cross space, you just get like... like you've got a couple of mm. obstacles, then they're there. Search for Spock gives us a proper journey, and this, I think, as an adventure film, I like the way that uh, it just ups and ups the ante. You know, you've got, you, you've, you've got like a comedy of errors going on, on on one hand, but you have so many things that they have to do to make it work. And it just feels like more of an adventure than we've had before. It's not really fair to compare it to Wrath of Khan in that respect, because Wrath of Khan's not an adventure film. But the, the other two are. To think that this just has such a, a stronger sense of escalation, it's probably better paced than the others are. We've got a nice payoff to everything in it, which we didn't have with the last one. Um, I think you're right that maybe the first act, if there is a weak part, is the first 20 minutes. But at the same time, everything beyond that is just it, 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 it. Like the snowball starts going and going and going and getting bigger and getting bigger. It's juggling a lot of balls, but it catches all of them. Yeah. yeah. In that respect, I'm going to give this one five stars. I enjoyed it more than Wrath of Khan. I, this is, I guess, where it, what favorite and best are two different things. You know, someone said Wrath of mm. Khan's a better piece of cinema. I go, all right, fine, maybe. You'd say, like, there's stronger character work going on here. There's maybe more of a, uh, a character journey, maybe more of an arc or whatever. But at the same time, if I was just putting one of them on, it would be this one. I I think I think this one's fantastic. And I think everything is, even if you're not a Star Trek fan, you'd really enjoy this. Yeah, it's, def- it's definitely a little more grounded. And obviously, with it being set, well, not so much modern times anymore, but uh, with it being a fairly contemporary setting, I guess people who are kind of would normally be repelled by the, the cold sci-fi of usual Star Trek would find a bit, a bit more welcoming as well. Uh, I'm going to give it four stars myself. Uh, I, again, really enjoyable. Barely a bad thing about it and just a great film to watch. But it's just lacking a, a certain something to give it a five-star rating for me, but it's still an absolutely great film. One, one of the best in this original ser- crew series, that's Remind for sure. me, were you, were you, did you give Wrath of Khan four as well, or did you give Wrath of Khan five? I can't remember. I think I might have given it a four and a half. I was sitting on the fence with that one. Mm. <laughs> I couldn't quite uh, decide. Because, again, I've seen that again recently at the cinema, and I've got to admit, I actually enjoyed seeing the motion picture a lot more on a big screen than I did Wrath of Khan. <laughs> I suppose it's using the, uh, the, the sort of the big screen maybe more than Wrath of Khan did, which is slightly more muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, I saw Wrath of Khan at the cinema as well. I thought it was, I thought it was great. It was a lot of little background details I hadn't noticed before. Oh, uh, yeah. The, I obviously seen it in that environment. You pick up on a lot from the sounds mm. to the visuals and it's, it's a, great experience but again there was some something just stopping me from giving that a, a full five stars as well oh what about yourself alistair where are you on this one gotta give it five and where do you stand on the uh wrath of can versus voyage home debate <laughs> Ooh, 
tough one. I think I gave that one five stars as well, but I do prefer uh, Wrath of Khan. It's the thing is there. I mean, it's a it's a sort of chalk and cheese thing because Wrath of Khan is such good drama, but this is such good fun adventure. Mm. They're two very different, and the fact that they're all three these films are all sort of connected as well. It's definitely both are. It's a different pace of film, um, but it's it's sort of that. Uh, you can't do the Wrath of Khan for every single film. You have to have different storylines. Mm. And this one certainly, certainly, for what it is, this is this film's the best version of itself, I think. How do you improve in it? And I'll give us five stars. So it's quite interesting. You said how different they are, and you're like, well, it shows how flexible the Star Trek template is, right? Because mm-hmm. Whilst Search for Spock combines elements of Wrath of Khan and Motion Picture, Motion Picture, Wrath of Khan and Voyage Home are very different movies from each other. And uh, we're going to have some very strange ones coming up next, but hey, that's for a future episode. Uh, For now, we're going to go to the list. like to try and finish off with a list around here and when it comes to something like star trek there are many lists to choose from folks i'm looking at screenrant.com's list of the five best and five worst crew members of all time now these this does not include captains it's just crew members and this article comes from the year 2020 so it does not include the most recent seasons who do we reckon is, let's do the five best, first of all. What crew members do you reckon, for across the incarnations, are going to be the five best crew members? Does it count Cisco before he was made captain? Uh, <laughs> I do not, it does not appear to have Cisco before he was captain. Maybe they just don't like I'm him. I'm detail to point out. He gets promoted in <laughs> season four, I think it is. Commander to, to camp. But it's because he's the man in charge. You know, I always sort of... That he's sort of an honorary captain until he yeah. gets officially crowned. I'm going to say, I don't know, best. Worf's got to be on that list. Oh, was one very obvious person that will get away first. I'm, I'm going to say Riker, surely, isn't there? Oh, you say Ry- Riker is one of the five best, you reckon? Uh, Riker yeah. is not on the five oh. best. Okay. What about Worf? Uh, no, Worf's not on this list either. Mm-hmm. What? Odo? Uh, yeah, Odo's on here. Uh, Odo is there. Uh, this would be, he'd be number four. So with Odo, they say at times Odo struggles to get along with people different from him since he felt isolated and alone from the rest of his species. He turned, uh, turned to be very different from him. Despite all this, he turned out to be the best security officer of a Deep Space Nine station could have possibly asked for. A strong sense of justice. And also was gracious enough to recognise when he was wrong. Plus, his love-hate chemistry of Quark remains legendary to this day, as well as the many <laughs> quips these two frenemies share. So yeah, they like Odo. And also committed genocide 200 years in the future for an alternative timeline of... Uh, <laughs> I remember <laughs> that episode. Yeah. <laughs> um, hmm, and, uh, See, I've been watching Deep Space Nine too much recently, so yeah. most of those are sticking in my well, head. Well, let's think about let's think about the original one. Uh, Bones is got to be up there. Bones is uh, not Do- on there. No, okay. Uh, he, he should be. He's my favourite. Scott, you say? No. <laughs> come on, come on. We've got a certain logical character, a logical Spock. choice. Yes, exactly. He's he wins this. They say. Okay. Have you, you ever said that Vulcans don't have a sense of humour? Clearly, never met Spock. But again, he was only half Vulcan and half human, but still raised according to the Vulcan principles. Unless he lost his inhibitions, which happened very rarely, Spock was a voice of reason, even in the most difficult situations, and blah, 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 blah. Basically, they love Spock. So, yeah, Spock makes the list. Uh, Data. Data is also on the list. He is their second best. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh... Maybe wouldn't put in there myself. <laughs> uh, I think D is an absolute arse. Oh, what have we got? Uh, what about? Um, I, I was wondering if uh, Major Kira would count as crew, or would even appear on that list. 
Uh, it's no one on that list called that. I guess we've got a. If it's 2020, will it incorporate any of the Discovery characters? It it could well know. do. I've um, I've been avoiding the the latest incarnation of Trek for that reason. Michael Burnham. Uh, Michael Maybe. Burnham is not. I was going to say no. that uh, there's a character from Enterprise on here. Uh, that'll be asked as. Uh, <laughs> the Paul. Uh, it is uh, Hoshi Sato. Oh, really? Okay. It's Ooh, that's surprising. About, I know that uh, Seven of Nine was popular with the uh, Nerd Boys <laughs> back in the day. In a Lara Croft kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, but, a, there's a couple of women who make the, who make the, the, the worst list. Although Oksana Troy has got to be on the worst list, I'm, I'm guessing. I've been Deanna Troy. Deanna Troy, yeah, she is. She, oh. they, say, they say about her, they say, let's establish something straight away. Jenna Troy wasn't a bad character. Her betazoid ability to read the emotions of others could have helped to crew a lot. Unfortunately, Counselor uh, Troy became the victim of the phenomenon known as bad, lazy writing. She rarely got enough space, <laughs> and the most memorable thing about her are her funny disagreements with her mum, um, and we don't get any of her work accomplishments really mattering. So yeah, she makes the list of the worst characters. Yeah, is that of all that fair? Would you say? Yeah, it, it is. They could have done more with the character, and they didn't. But I think her best episode was when I think she was undercover on board a Romulan ship. That was uh, I forget the title of that episode. But that was her character is shown in that episode. But that that's that's it really. Now, now, elsewhere, we have, uh, for the worst, the fifth worst, uh, they describe her as, if the most remarkable thing about her, besides her somewhat eccentric hairstyle, is her unfortunate crush on Captain Kirk, who barely paid attention to her most of the time. Who is that? Nurse, Nurse Chapel. Uh, no, it's not. Oh, um, oh, no, the name's escaped me now. I think I could picture her. She's got, like, blonde hair and it's set in a peculiar weave yes uh, yeoman her, something her name is janice rand yes that's right that's uh, yeah. janice rand we say she could have been awesome but she isn't uh, <laughs> next up <laughs> yeah. so this character had centuries of experience on her side which might be one of the reasons that she remained calm even if the rest of the crew had a tendency to panic She's smart and courageous, ready to take her enemies in battle and also to battle her friends in a game. She's well-educated, independent, but also had a wicked sense of humour. To top it all off, she was an excellent fighter. Unfortunately, she... Uh, well, I'm not going to say what happened to her, but <laughs> she... Uh, but, uh, 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 she I is... Yes, that's, yeah, the, one. So that's the one, absolutely. Worst characters. Yeah, yeah, no, she, no, she's best. She's, she's, she's best. best. Yeah, she's. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, now we go back to a worse one. The next worst one was was <laughs> Diana right. Troy. Then the next best was Odo's. We've had him already. Next worst. So, again, insert name wasn't all that bad. He was a capable pilot and helped a crew more than once when they needed it. Plus, he was a good friend to his fellow crew members, but he was also a bit too hot-headed and irresponsible which are character traits that are simply the worst for any Starfleet officers, especially the one on whose calm state of mind and rational thinking alter- could save or alternatively destroy, if he wasn't so calm and rational, hundreds of lives. This guy was in the uh, series Voyager. Paris. No. Oh, wait, who did you say, sorry? Tom Paris. Tom Paris, yes. Sorry if he says something else. Yes, Tom Paris is their pick there. Now we come to the... Uh, so we've got the second best data we've already mentioned. Come to the second worst. So to be fair, insert name. Uh, to insert name, he wasn't entirely bad at his job. In fact, his expertise was helped to sit, has helped to save the day and his crew more than once. He even invented the insert name alert. Sorry, the red alert. But his big fault was his personality. He was a bit of a pedant and liked to argue with people whenever he believed he was in the right and they were wrong, which happened a lot. Simply said, he wasn't very, very much user friendly. He wasn't very much user friendly. Bad sentence, which made it difficult to get along with him. And Starfleet officers should not only be good at their job, but also good team players, which he wasn't. Who is that a description of? 
Reed. Yes. Um, Christopher. Malcolm Reed. Matt said. Yes. Uh, And next up, we have Spock. So we come to the worst character. (laughs) This character, uh, they popularized the phrase uh, Gary Stew. So we're looking at a. uh, This is already. uh, So who do do you reckon we're talking about here? Wesley Crusher. Absolutely. They say he's a prime example of the unfortunate type of character who knows everything best, does everything best, and leaves even more experienced officers behind in the dust. Wesley was simply portrayed as too perfect, so in the end he just ended up being annoying and a bit arrogant too, to be honest. (laughs) His mum, Beverly Crusher, was much better at her job as a ship's doctor. So, that's the five best and five worst crew captains. Anyone that we haven't mentioned on either side who you really can't stand or who you think is amazing. Harry Kim was a uh, very short-changed character on Voyager. Uh, there's often a joke about him, just he'll never rise above the rank of Ensign. And despite a lot of his heroics that he did, he never once got promoted. Right, let's say, like, uh, I can't stand Q. I know he's one of the popular really? villains from the next gen, but he gets on my tits. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It seems, to, uh, even the way they're introduced to the Borg is just too fucking convenient. It's just, uh, I decide I'm going to fuck with you today, so I'll click my fingers and you're halfway across the, you know, the galaxy in, in uncharted space, just because, like... He's got a lot of whimsy about him. There's got to be better ways of writing these <laughs> villains into the film rather than Q just going, you know what? We're doing this today. <laughs> I, I can't believe the list didn't include McCoy. He's my clear favourite. Oh, definitely in the uh, popular ones, yeah. I mean, he's always got the great one line, as especially when, well, he's normally just arguing, isn't he? So. <laughs> he's both the heart of the films and just the kind of grump of them all as well. You know, I just, yeah, I like him. He's versatile. And, mm. uh, yeah, uh, folks... That is all we've got time for for this episode. We will be back with more Trek. Hopefully before Christmas, we have another, uh, because we're the Horror Cult Films podcast, we do have another horror-based one to come before it. In the meantime, live long and prosper. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.